Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage here in San Francisco for Databricks' Data Plus AI Summit. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Rob Stretch and I have been here two days breaking down all the action. We had the analysts on, and now we're psyched to have the co-founder and chief architect, Natai Zaharia, who's here with us in the press room. Thanks for making time out of your super busy schedule. Been on stage, been giving demos, meetings, back to back, having fun. Yeah, having fun, yeah. Definitely been hectic, but it's awesome to talk to you. Yeah. You know, it's great to see the rise of Databricks um, and continued growth. Obviously, big event here, 12,000 people. <laughs> Younger crowd, I see a lot of open source developers out there, and I see a lot of data people, engineering, uh, and you guys have the theme going on around democratizing uh, uh, AI, basically, and bringing mm -hmm. AI to the masses. Uh, bold vision, great vision, we love it. What does that mean for Databricks? As you guys mm -hmm. have rolled out, you've been very successful as a company, you continue to get more data, you've been doing the lake house, you yeah. have great open source presence with, uh, with your code, mm -hmm. um, data sharing's been booming, things are happening. Mm -hmm. What's the key ingredient to make AI work for you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So I think just um, you know supporting generative AI is a very natural progression to what we've been doing since we started out. We we set out to democratize, you know, working with very large data sets. That was our bread and butter. Uh, we integrated it into the traditional data stack with data warehousing that we've been doing, and we've always supported you know machine learning and data science. And uh, generative AI is a very you know effective, very powerful form of machine learning that basically every company is trying to apply. It's it, it's, a, it's extremely uh, general in its applications. Uh, and we think we have uh, you know, both a, some great existing foundations to support the whole life cycle of it, from the data prep to the serving and so on. And we just, you know, we reach the exact same users in each enterprise that want to build the generative AI stuff. So it's awesome to work with them. So I want to ask your, your thoughts on it. We're going to get to the security piece in a minute. Obviously people want, want their IP to be protected. Yep. Data is their intellectual property. You guys yep. have a very strong position on that in the keynote. We'll get that in a second. But the enterprise needs and cloud enablement are two factors we've been seeing a lot of conversations around. How do you see the LLM movement, large language models, and generative mm -hmm. AI specifically take advantage of this next generation cloud as well as the needs of the enterprise, which are different than say yes. a, a, a straight up developer? Yeah, yeah, the needs of the enterprise are very different and this is exactly the thing that we're specializing in and the thing that I think we, um, you know, we can provide unique value in e even compared to the very generic like language model as a service type of providers. So a lot of those providers are focused on consumer apps, you know, that, that uh, are trained with just data from the internet that can talk about public knowledge in various ways. You know, you, they're very amazing, you know, kind of applications like ChatGPT, you can ask it about anything you know, eventually it will do things like search the web, um, and and it's great. But in the enterprise, uh, first of all, you need like um, uh, a level of precision and, and reliability that's quite a bit higher. That's that's hard to build. There's a lot of R and D in that. Then you also wanted to understand your specific um, your specific. Um, you know, data that you've got in your company. Um, so, and, and your specific jargon and business terms and so on. So for example, you might have trade secrets, right? If you're TSMC manufacturing, you know, processors better than anyone else in the world, there's a whole lot of stuff in there that you want your internal people to know about, but there's no way like OpenAI knows about it. Um, you know, there may be um, other proprietary knowledge. Like if you're a medical research firm and like all the science papers yeah. say one thing about an enzyme, and you just discovered that it works a different way and it's going to lead to the next breakthrough, how do you get that research into like your, you know, your AI applications? Um, so this is the kind of thing that we're enabling, um, we're enabling folks to do. And, um, you know, it's very exciting to see the, the interest in it already. Yeah, we've seen, um, we've reported that AWS uh, in Bedrock has that same capability to keep everything in the VPCs of mm -hmm. the cloud, so you can actually start to segment kind of that data access. Yep. Well, how does that change uh, uh, the, the role of authorization and access controls? How do you see that playing out? Is that part of governance or mm -hmm. management? Who, who controls that piece? Yeah, yeah, so so we do, yeah, we w um, we, we think enterprises would want to control it in very domain-specific ways, and we, mm -hmm. we're building the governance tools uh, for AI based on the rich governance tools we already have for data and for sort of more classical data science and machine learning. Uh, we have something called Unity Catalog, which is the only 
um, basically data catalog in the industry that also spans AI and unstructured files and gives you very rich controls, lineage quality across them. And with generative AI, one of the new challenges is you want to train on lots of data. You, you Maybe you get it from the web or other places, but at the same time, some of it is wrong. Maybe uh, some of the policies around uh, copyrighted data and use of that are changing over time. So you really want to trace exactly what data went into this and be able to fix that as you release your applications. And I think increasingly just through regulation, you'll be required to sort of explain and document what went in there. Um, so it, it, it is a new set of use cases where this matters. So I want to ask you about the competition. We were just talking with our analyst team uh, on our segment earlier today and, uh, and before we came on camera about mm -hmm. the other guides. Um, they want mm. to run, manage the data and control mm -hmm. um, the data and govern it. And then they want to let the people build apps on top, say analytics. You guys, mm -hmm. your vision is to govern the data and the analytics, right? What's the what's mm -hmm. the vision of Databricks? What's the specific yeah. uh, uh, goal? I mean, one of, one of the big things we, we've always bet on is, uh, is basically open interfaces, so that means open storage format, so you can use any computing engine and platform with it, open um, APIs like, uh, like Apache Spark and MLflow and so on, uh, because we think that will give customers a lot more uh, choice and, and ultimately lead to a better architecture for their company, you know, that's going to last for like decades mm -hmm. as, they, as they build out these applications. Um, so we, we're doing everything in that way, where like if, if some new thing comes around that's like better at ML training than we are, or better at, you know, uh, you know like SQL analytics or whatever, you can actually connect it to your data. You don't have to re-platform your whole enterprise, maybe like lose out some capabilities you like from Databricks in order to get this other thing. And you don't have to copy data back and forth and generate, you know, zillions of dollars of like data movement. Yeah, great, great, great uh, call out there. I want to ask you about the uh, Mosaic and Million Product yes. training. Uh, yes. Big acquisition, big number, 1.3 mm -hmm. billion. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been tracking Devine's company. Obviously, we've known him before yep. he sold his first company to Intel, uh, and when we've kind of been reporting since he launched his company. Those guys were were have a lot of GPUs on hand, mm -hmm. and they were going to do more. So they mm -hmm. they were about to do a big capex build out anyway to build up that training. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Ying to, to Yang to training is inference, but they're the training side. Um, mm -hmm. Is there more work to do there on the CapEx side for mm -hmm. the, the training piece with uh, Mosaic ML? And how does that relate into what you're building or yep. have built in the current Databricks? Yeah, we, th there definitely is uh, work. And uh, the, the way Mosaic ML um, you know, um, uh, handled capacity, uh, a lot of it was sort of a very uh, kind of easy to use SaaS model where you can sort of submit a job and they'll run it and they'll have a big pool of GPUs that you know they can assign to different workloads or even use internally for research when it's idle. Uh, so we, we really like that model. It's basically a serverless model, which is also what we've been doing with data warehousing and with model serving now uh, and eventually you know basically everything on our platform will work that way so we think a provider like us or like mosaic who can um, uh, you know who can serve many customers and, and and share a pool of resources and optimize that will just provide inherent advantages in availability and TCO and like ease of experimentation how would you and describe for the folks watching uh, who are, are learning about inference and training which is harder which is are they can you even compare them their apples mm -hmm. to oranges. Uh, what's the difference between training and inference from yeah. an impact standpoint, from an architecture, how you think about it? How would you yeah. explain training and inference? Because they go hand in hand, they're yin and yang, but they're two different yeah. things. They do, yeah. So so, so training is, is when you build your model, it includes a, a lot of, um, in some cases, it includes a lot of sort of machine learning sort of know-how, like what, what exactly is my objective? How do I get really good examples of data? How do I even evaluate the quality? Uh, and it includes heavy weight computation on the biggest GPUs. Uh, inference is actually serving predictions and it can range from sort of trivial if you don't if you don't have a high rate of requests you know like it's for say internal users in your company and you get a couple of requests per minute um, then it's you know it's not very expensive to serve um, it, it can it can range from that to extremely challenging if you have 
many automated systems like you know every time a log record is written by a piece of software you want to analyze it or if you care about super low latency like you're doing ad bidding and you want to like read the text of the web page and place an ad and you know that so so there, there's a huge amount of depth there in general inference is being um, easier to optimize if you can train a model that does a certain thing there are so many techniques you can use to make it faster and these are some of the ones that we package and our model serving technician uh, solution and, and some of the ones where Mosaic ML has done research. It's a, yeah. you know, it's a group of researchers yeah. who started the company. Yeah, so. great, great, great description. Talk about the LLMs because I want to get into that. Everyone wants one now, they don't even know what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, a large language model, obviously. There's different sizes, there's proprietary, yep. there's a third party, the long tail of open source, developing nicely. Mm -hmm. When should someone build their own LLM? Mm -hmm. and when should they work with a managed service? Because there's yep. trade-offs. You got to get to know your data. That's been the thing mm -hmm. that came out of the conference for us uh, as, as you guys yeah. just talking to your customers know your data and you can get value out of it but when do I how do I deal with LLMs what, what, what if I want one what do I do do I just get my data and call it an LLM yeah no great <laughs> question yeah there, there is work required to build do it you could build something but to build one that's like really useful you're, you're going to need to do additional work otherwise you'll, you'll get something that spews back your own data and sort of a random format. Uh, but um, I, I think that there are a few factors to think about. So one of them is um, is the control of your data and it's, it's security, it's geographic placement, stuff like that. Like for example, if there's personal information in there, like you, you may, you know, you, you, you got to keep it in specific regions. Um, if there's like trade secrets and stuff like that, that you don't want to pass. So that's kind of a, an obvious one. A second one that I think is even more interesting is you, you may want to build your own model if you want the absolute best performance uh, in terms of quality and customizability. So uh, this is like, um, uh, you know, like b basically in, in any area where you want to be able to iterate on it and improve quality, you want to control all the pieces. And it's hard to do with these one size fits all models. For example, uh, something like ChatGPT gets a lot of value out of Reddit because it, it crawled Reddit, it, you know, it, it knows random stuff that people talked about. But if you're in a domain where you don't want to have that stuff, yeah. uh, then you can't you know, you can't really ask them to remove it. It's all baked in there. So I if you- It's a public corpus and they keep yeah. adding to it. That's your point about IP as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, not, not to mention the IP. Yeah, exactly. But they, they have, yeah, even the stuff on the web, like, you know, we think, oh, all the, the world's knowledge is on the web. But yeah, the web is also full of like junk, SEO, yeah. <laughs> totally <Pollution>. incorrect <laughs> things, yes. Uh, which you may not want uh, the thing to, to know about. Um, and, and if you also care about like computational cost or other interactions, like what if I want the model that knows how to talk to my internal database, like fig see a user's latest orders, you know, do something for them. All that stuff is easier to do, to customize, to get to like 99 9.9% .9 reliability if you can own the whole stack. Um, and then I think the third reason would be a just a strategic reason, like you may, you know, if you think you'll develop, like if you have unique data, you can probably very soon create unique like AI products also, and you may want a team that can do that. And you would, you know, you could sell like the, the chat GPD of, you know, like finance or whatever, like, you know, retail, wh whatever it D2B is. Right? video, that's the Yeah, cube. video, that's an awesome one, yeah. Yeah, you showed me like, <laughs> you, yeah, you folks are doing some Well, really we got cool a lot things. of linguistics, and, and I want to yeah. ask you about the future, because I see, mm -hmm. uh, we're hearing some people in the hallway, and we're kind of riffing with some of the entrepreneurs that built on top of Databricks, you know, old school techniques like Kumo has a recommendation engine background. They essentially have mm -hmm. personalization and neural networks and graph database as a service with you guys. So they're mm -hmm. like a super yeah, app yeah. on top of, on mm -hmm. top of Databricks. Yeah. We're going to see more of those. We think we'll see more examples like that. Yep. But you know, a lot of the old AI models were built on seed, seed algorithms and setting up the ontologies, mm -hmm. if you will, in language. Mm -hmm. Do you see more dynamic ad hoc um, hmm. LLMs emerging in the future where things will just grow n dynamically in with AI. Do you see AI going down that down that path? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So adapting more to sort of new modalities of data. Uh, I, I think it could happen, yeah. I think it is hard, like even though LLMs are powerful, it's actually not super easy to bridge to a traditional machine learning and the signals there and all the metrics. So I think it's a it's a somewhat open yeah. question, but definitely the idea of integrating LLMs with things like knowledge graphs and other, you know, like structured tables uh, makes a lot of sense. We're also seeing some really cool multimodal applications. If you've got some time series or images or, or videos, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. So cool. it will be, what, that's one of the things I'm really excited about with customizability as well. You can build 
models for the unique domains in your application. You know, if you've got the best image sensors on the market, the best gene sequencers, you know, if you've got like a jet plane with mm -hmm. like 10,000 sensors in it, you can build AIs that understand that modality, so. Yeah, this is what we call the data developer of this merge, and we see a future where AI is going to be native in applications. Today, most people are thinking about AI in, in coming into an exact application mm -hmm. and adding mm -hmm. value, obviously augmentation or bolt-on. We think there's also going to be a direction where there's going to be native yeah. AI applications that might be lighter weight, faster, but in the application, and then more horizontal scalable data products that will need to work in real time with these yeah. data sets. What's your reaction to that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So you, you talked about the data developer. So you've been seeing a lot of our top customers, major software vendors actually, who say things like, I have several thousand you know, engineers, and I want all of my engineering teams that build a feature to also be, to also own their data, like to do their data engineering or to do their own ML engineering. For example, one of these vendors say, like look at my user interface, everywhere you see a text field in here, everywhere you see a drop down, it should be able to recommend stuff, you know? Like it should tell you like whatever, this ticket assigned it to this person, whatever it is. <laughs> um, and of course they want those feature teams to own it. So we're seeing, and actually even internally, you know, we announced um, AI features and like our SQL editors, notebooks and search. So we're also embedding yeah. uh, basically engineers into, into those to do those things. Matei, you're like a master class here on theCUBE. Really appreciate your time. Uh, Final couple questions. As you look at the future, you know, reasoning has been around for a while in mm -hmm. AI circles, as you know. Meta, you got metadata, you got reasoning to it. Mm -hmm. What's the big aha moment? What's the big inflection point now about reasoning mm -hmm. that was different than before? Was it the LLMs? Is it the more compute power? Is it the mm -hmm. confluence of all these things coming together at this yeah. one time? What's the, why is reasoning better now than it was? That yeah, th that's an interesting question. So I would actually say th there are different types of reasoning. I think with LLMs and the, the kind of stuff you can do with chain of thought, it, it's much easier to do kind of fuzzy reasoning with kind of fuzzy concepts, right? That's, that's really the thing that they've given us. Like computers are very good at precise stuff. On the other hand, there are other things like the chess engines, the, um, you know, like optimizers that solve a giant problem for like scheduling. Those in some sense did reasoning, but in a, in, a, in a very different way. And actually LLMs are not that good at that. And I, I actually think you'll want to combine them as external tools. So for fuzzy stuff where like, you know, there's no precise description, but there's like common sense, um, you can do it. But for stuff like solving math problems and so on, honestly, like I think the existing tools are in many ways more more useful and, and they can do things that like people already couldn't do. Yeah. Um, and maybe you'll combine them for something even better. Yeah, that's a great question on the fuzzy versus more specific. Uh, let's talk about the vector database. It's been all the rage, mm -hmm. everyone's announcing a vector database. I mean, you know, <laughs> who doesn't have a vector database <laughs> these days? So why is it important to have a vector database versus using off the shelf? I know you get platforms as big, big wave mm -hmm. right now. Uh, why a vector database, why is it important? Yeah, I think I, I, mean, I think vector search is important. So vector index, the ability to search on these, you know, numerical uh, embeddings that can can do fuzzy matching. Uh, but I do think it's something that may will probably be incorporated into many technologies in the same way that like most modern, you know, data processing engines have um, like um, you know basically like starts and arrays and stuff like that. Uh, basically, these like sort of unstructured data types in inside. I think maybe soon they'll have you know vector and vector search. So we're definitely looking at it more holistically as yeah. like, you know, in your tables, in your engine, can you just use these? But it, it does open up this, you know, powerful like matching. It is yeah. really more of search, less database kind of concept. Yeah, that, that's my feeling. We'll see how it develops. You know, it's a new, it's a new area for yeah. sure. Final question for you, and I really appreciate your time. What do you guys have to do now at Databricks to bring this AI to life that's net new capabilities and how much mm -hmm. are you leveraging internally with previous work done? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so I think the we're building on a lot of the foundation in terms of data management, governance, data pipelines, and, and ML ops that we had, um, including like serving and monitoring models. The most, um, the biggest difference with uh, generative AI language and, and image and so on is it's much harder to automatically evaluate the output, right? Like before you were doing predictions, you just see like, hey, how many of 
of the ads I showed it a person click or whatever. It's just a number. With this, how can you tell like whether this paragraph you created today is better than the one you created yesterday? So people are looking for new tools there. You can do some automated stuff. You know, you can ask a model, you can look for keywords. You, I think you bring in human uh, evaluators a lot more and you ask them, what do you think of this? Um, you know, you can, but, but that's, I think the big open thing. So we, we have like UIs now in our uh, ML platform offering where like you can compare, you know, just a big spreadsheet of text snippets and say which one you like. And we're working on, uh, you know, various other uh, ways to do this, including integration with, with partners in this space. As chief technologist, got to ask you the question, two, two points to the question. Mm -hmm. um, what's the coolest thing you've seen here mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the event? And what's the coolest thing you're working on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I, I think, um, I mean, honestly, the, the coolest <laughs> thing uh, I, I saw was the, the Rivian, <laughs> you know, vehicle in the in the expo hall and like the, the discussion of the tech behind that. It's, it's really amazing, you know, like it's not, it's not just like, oh, you know, it's, it's electric, it's got a battery. Basically, you know, as it drives like every component of that system which works in these extreme environments they they monitor it they have software there they can update it and sort of they learn how to how to make that on better so i think it's sort of the future of a lot of um a, a lot of basically stuff that you, you know you build industrially it makes so much sense um and um and uh things we're working on um i think the thing I, I'm really excited about is this basically opening data to, um, you know, less technical users, to business users directly with, with Lakehouse IQ, uh, which is this knowledge engine that sort of learns how you query your data, how that maps to business questions. And, you know, lots of folks in the industry are working on this, but if this succeeds, I think it will open up data, AI, and so on to way more users. Uh, it's very cool to see that. Great. Uh, Questions keep jumping in my head. Final, final question, I promise. The, when Ollie's on stage, he said the format wars are over, that unification message really hit home to a lot of people, they like that. Mm -hmm. Where'd that come from, just the philosophy of Databricks? Like you, know, you know we open source, but that eliminates a lot of this confusion. What does that mean when mm -hmm. you guys, when he says you're eliminating the format war? Yeah, so, so this is about the different Lakehouse data formats. So it's kind of an interesting evolution where for a while, um, you know, everyone in the open source world was just using Apache Parquet for large data sets, but then it was only a file format, it couldn't do transactions and stuff. So these three different open source projects started that do that, and all of them, like 99.99% of the bytes are these Parquet files, and there's little little files on the side with metadata that tell you like, you know, here's the latest version, here's the transaction log. And, um, you know, I mean, they, they started out, we started Delta Lake, there was Apache Iceberg and uh, Apache Hoodie, and then I think a lot of vendors kind of got pressure from customers to support open data, but they were worried about like there being a single format that runs, especially their competitors format. So they would say, oh yeah, I do support it, but it's this other one. Um, mm -hmm. And so it creates a lot of confusion for customers, right? So um, because these are so similar, we, we built a capability that just in your Delta table, you can read and write it as all three formats. It simply just creates that metadata three times um, and you can just open it up like any any tool that understands, say, Iceberg, for example, can connect through that catalog API and write to it. So we think, I mean, all our customers yeah. uh, cheered <laughs> when they <laughs> saw this because they had these headaches of like, yeah. oh shoot, am I in, in the wrong ecosystem? And hopefully, um, you know, hopefully it gets people to focus on like what you do with the data itself and uh, and really like, you know, like let, get, let customers actually move workloads between platforms and use the best one. It's a win all around, congratulations. Thanks for coming on and congratulations Congratulations on the success. Uh, to tell Ali, we, we, we passed along, we missed him on this one. I knew he was super busy as well. I appreciate you taking the time out of your super busy schedule. Thanks, Thanks a lot. On. Okay, this is theCUBE, here with the co-founder of Databricks, sharing all the data, masterclass of what's going on with Databricks today and then in the future as Gen AI comes up forward, it's going to be a, a developer-centric, business-focused world. Thanks for coming on today, appreciate your time.